Hey everyone, welcome back to another video from A Man Talks FPL SC. We are talking round 21 in the NRL Supercoach season. Lots of injuries, lots of teamless news to get into. We're running out of trades, so what are we going to do with our teams? Who should we bring in with our final trades for the back end of the season? All that good stuff. Let's get straight into the video. A quick update on how I did last week. If you guys haven't heard already, I actually featured on the SC Whisperers podcast doing a round 20 roundup. So if you guys haven't checked that out, I will put a link for that in the description below. Basically, you're just going to hear me crying about not captaining Tommy Turbo because I took the vice captain loop on Cody Walker. I finished on 1,416, so it wasn't a horrible week. But when Tommy Tavojevic sets the Supercoach record with 226 points and you don't captain him, yet yeah, not a great week for myself. 334 rank drop. I'm sitting at 3,000. And 35 for the season still in the top 2% overall but if I can crack that top 1% that would be a great achievement for myself to the end of the season so this week I'm not really going to go through a lot of the team news because I think most of the key outs are through injuries and I think a lot of people might be already clued up on that so I thought we'd just get straight into the best trade targets for the round Bradman Best and Harry Grant were two guys I wanted to highlight who just came back from big injuries themselves and they came back with a bang Bradman Best I actually brought him in last week uh, to fund Daily Cherry Evans and he absolutely killed it for me playing on the left edge, 107 points that he scored. And with the Knights draw that I keep harping on and on and on about, uh, I think he's one of the best pickups that you can pick up in the center wing, given that run home is so super strong. A uh, 383k, he's super, super cheap, and his break-even is very low at 9, so I think he's a perfect trade-in target for your center wing. And given that low price tag that he's got, he's able to fund money, you know, if you're trying to do an upgrade to, say, the man below him in Harry Grant. Harry Grant, I think, in my opinion, is the number one hooker to go for in this game. And with a 596k price tag, it's actually not too expensive. Um, he's got an 81 break even, so you don't necessarily have to go for him this week. But I think in round 21, as you can see, five games left of this season. I think if you are tossing and turning about potentially bringing in guys, I think the earlier that you do so, the better. Because they're just going to be available for you for more games towards the back end of the season which just means they're going to get you more points. And what I do like about Harry Grant is that because he's coming off such a long injury layoff, I think he's less of a risk to actually be rested towards the back end of the season because I've got a good feeling that the Melbourne Storm are going to be doing that throughout the end of the season. We saw that at the back end of last season as well. And I think given how much some of their guys have played, like a Jerome Hughes, um, a Cam Munster, even Nico Hines potentially, um, they've got the flexibility to rest their team because they're sitting so pretty at the top of the ladder. But Harry Grant, I think, is an exception to that. I think the Storm are going to want to get... Um, you know, runs in his legs in the lead up to the finals. So I think he's actually less of a risk. And the draw for the Storm, yes, it doesn't really matter too much because the Storm are that good, but it's not that bad. You know, they've got Manly this week, who actually conceded quite a few points to hookers. So I think Harry Grant is still a great asset even for this week. Then you've got the Raiders, the Titans, the Eels, who the wheels are falling off just a little bit, and then the Sharks in round 25 to finish up. So I think Harry Grant is probably the best trade-in target to go for this week, alongside Bradman Best himself. And I think with best low price tag I think he could be a good enabler to create the funds to get up to a Harry Grant the next kind of topic I wanted to get into was Nathan Cleary based on the late mail that we're hearing as of Wednesday evening when I'm recording um, he's apparently a good chance of returning in round 21 against the Roosters and this could be a make or break for the end of your season if you're able to get in Nathan Cleary as a point of difference to the entire Supercoach community Obviously, there is a big re-injury risk with him because his shoulder injury was pretty bad and he's got a 216 break even. So I think there is an opportunity to wait this week, given it's also a pretty tough matchup against the Roosters. If you are looking to bring in Cleary, I think it would be sensible to wait at least a week just to see how he pulls up. Because if he looks really good against the Roosters, even if he scores 100, you know, he'll lose a stack of cash and you can pick him up at a bit more of an affordable price tag because he is sitting at over a million dollars at the moment. And you can bring him back for a prime matchup against the Dragons in round 22. And that gives you a month of Nathan Cleary when other people are struggling with trades and money to be able to bring him in. I think if you are looking to bring him in or if you've got like a Sean Johnson still sitting there that you're happy to wait on for another week to upgrade to Cleary, that's definitely how I would play it in terms of waiting an extra week. Whether or not Cleary is worth it, personally, uh, I think if you've got four or more trades, I think it's worth taking the gamble. You know, maybe giving yourself one spare trade just in the off chance he gets injured again, then you can actually use that trade to flip him out. Because just looking at the averages of the other halfbacks around him, he's far and away the best halfback with 114 average. Next best is Jerome Hughes at 75. Hughes is potentially a late out this week with a calf issue. As I mentioned, I think he's a good chance of arresting from the Melbourne Storm. So for that reason, I think if you haven't got Hughes already, like myself, I actually went to DCE last week purely for that reason of the potential ri uh, risk of a rest. I maybe wouldn't go for a Hughes. And Cherry Evans, he's super expensive at 814k now. I think last week was probably the best time to get him um, if not maybe next week and at that point 
you know, Cherry Evans and Cleary might only be maybe 150k difference in price. And I think when you're getting an average difference of 40 points a game, I think in my opinion, it's probably worth jumping up to a Nathan Cleary at that point instead of going to a Cherry Evans. The next best average, averaging halfback is Sam Walker at 71. And he's pretty decently of, uh, priced at 400. I think he's around the mid 400k's at the moment. And the Roosters draw in the, from round 22 onwards is also, is also very good. So if you are looking for a halfback, you could go for a Sam Walker and pivot away from a Nathan Cleary. But potentially, I think I'm really attracted to that kind of point of difference factor that Cleary gets. Although I think the re-injury risk is a big thing to be taking account for. But I think if you're someone who's kind of lower ranked and looking to really, really chase hard, and you've got really nothing else to lose, then I think you're probably a better off chance of you know being successful getting a Nathan Cleary. Because I think the guys at the top, that re-injury risk might put them off. So I think if it's more of a case, I think if you're sitting further back in the pack, like myself at 3,000 rank, as you saw, Braden Trindle, look, it's going to sound crazy. He's averaging 40, but his three-round average is actually like 75. And the Sharks' run home for the rest of the season is really strong. We now know that Sean Johnson is out for the rest of the season, so Trindle is probably going to be goal-kicking. And I really like that draw for the Sharks. This is an absolute flyer if you want to go for a Braden Trindle at halfback instead of a Nathan Cleary. Um, but again, I think this is one of those cases where if you're just chasing point of difference players, you're just going help for leather, then you could go for a Braden Trindle, who is goal-kicking with a pretty decent draw to end the season. Now, fullbacks, we've spoken about fullbacks quite a bit in the past few weeks, given their importance to Supercoach and their point scoring. Clint Gutherson is very highly owned. I'm also an owner of Gutherson, and I think the key question is, you know, with that Eels tough run for the end of the season, he's lost a goal kicking now that Mitch Moses is back in the Eels lineup. Is Gutherson worth holding? I personally think he's not worth the hold, even though he's been pretty consistent so far this season. I haven't been too, you know, impressed by how the Eels have been performing recently. Obviously, I think the lack of Mitch Moses does play a part in that, but that draw for the rest of the season is really tough. So I am definitely keen on pivoting away from a Gutherson, because I think with that fullback position being so important, you can really capitalize on big points. In my opinion, the best three to go for is Caleb Ponga, Pappenhausen, or James Tedesco. And which of the three that you decide to go for, well, hopefully I can provide some reasons and help you make that decision. Personally, if I had to choose just one, I think I would go with Caleb Ponga. Reason being I would go for Caleb Ponga is his draw is the best to end the season. Uh, three of his five games is Broncos twice and then the Bulldogs who concede so many points to fullbacks as do the Titans and the Sharks so I think overall that run for Ponga is really really strong I think team motivation also comes into it in that the Knights are in strong contention for finishing in the top eight and I don't see them really resting uh, Kalen Ponga um, for the back end of the season because I think they're going to really really be pushing hard to get into that top eight versus say like a Tedesco who I think potentially has a slightly greater chance of uh, resting although I feel like that's not really going to be so prevalent as we've seen in the Roosters in the past, because I think they're also a good uh, shot at getting in the top four. So I think that resting risk doesn't really apply for Tedesco. Um, and Pappenhausen, there is some potentially some rest risk um, with the Melbourne Storm, but I think he's also similar to Harry Grant in the fact that in that the Melbourne Storm might be trying to get extra runs in Pappenhausen's legs for the lead up into the finals. So I think ne neither of those three are at risk of a rest really, but I think Caleb Ponga has probably the least chance of getting a rest and he's got the best draw to end the season. So I really like Ponga. He did super well last week against the Raiders, and he's so cheap at 536k. You can make like 80, 90k going from Gutherson to Ponga. So I really, really like that trade. If you haven't got faith in, say, the Knights or Ponga, because he also has had some injury concerns himself, Tedesco looks to be one of the better options, I think, with the Broncos and the Dragons in round 22 and 23, and then the Raiders in round 25. Pretty decent draw to end the season, apart from this game against the Panthers. So I think if you're in that position where you can potentially wait a week on it, I would go for a Tedesco. And I think similar applies for Pappenhausen, given that they're versing the Manly Sea Eagles. I think if you've got that flexibility of potentially waiting a week on trading out Clint Gutherson, I think it gives you a good chance to look at Pappenhausen and Tedesco one more time in a tough matchup that you don't really need them for. But if you're looking to go for it um, and maximize your points, I think bringing in Ponga this week is a great option at fullback. Other options I've got here are like a Latrell, Adam Dewey, a Reese Walsh. Reese Walsh, I'm not so keen on because I haven't. Uh, you know, the Warriors attack doesn't seem to be putting on that many points. Yes, he is goal kicking, but I think he also is uh, getting a bit of that wear and tear playing in his rookie season. So for that reason, I'm not so hot on a Reese Walsh anymore. Adam Dewey, I think if you are happy to have him at fullback, is an exceptional uh, target as well with that really great run to end the season and he goal kicks. But my preference, as I've stated previously on the channel, is to have him in at 5'8 instead of fullback. And Luttrell, I think the draw for the Rabbitohs isn't the best now for the rest of the season with the Eels, the Panthers, and the Roosters in the last end of the season. 
Um, and I do sometimes just question his ability to always be engaged in the game and, you know, get those big ceiling scores. Um, obviously, he scored a big 100 last week as well, but we can see him potentially get, you know, those lower scores. So for that reason, the troll, I think if you haven't got him in already, I would 100% be putting more weight into getting like a Ponga, Tedesco or a Pappenhausen. But as I made it pretty clear, I think Ponga is the best option to go for for the end of the season to replace Clint Gutherson. So we'll kind of go through an analysis of the trade-ins and trade-outs, and this is kind of where the team news starts coming in. If you look at that trade-outs column, we've got injured players like Dane Laurie, Brian To'o, Ben Hunt, Katoni Staggs, uh, Jaden Braley, uh, James Fisher Harris, Sean Johnson, Toe Harris. Basically, all of those guys are injured, so it makes complete sense that they're in the trade-out list. A few guys I do want to call out, Nico Hines at 810k as the fourth most traded-out player. This one definitely is an interesting one because we're seeing now that Pappenhausen's returning from the bench, then he's starting to eat into Nico Hines' minutes. I personally wouldn't be trading him out myself just in the chance that the Storm do rest players. Nico Hines is probably going to be hanging around the 17. He does goal kick if Pappenhausen isn't playing uh, for whatever the reason that is. And I think he's a warm body that we can throw out there. Um, like personally, I'm also struggling to make a good 17 this week. So I'm more in favor of holding Nico Hines. But apparently with Jerome Hughes having that potential issue, he could be a late out. And I could see Nico Hines shifting into the starting halves position uh, alongside Cameron Munster this week. I think if he's starting, Nico Hines for me is not just indefinitely a hold, um, unless you've got that flexibility of extra trades and good coverage, because you can really capitalize on that 810k that trading him out would unlock. I personally am just not in that kind of position. So I think for me, he's personally a hold. Um, and I think if you're kind of teetering on the edge of, you know, 17 players and low trades, I personally would hold him as well. Jaden Braley as the sixth most traded out. He is having a rest this week after he copped a pretty bad head knock last week against the Raiders. Personally, he has been doing not that well for like the last two months, essentially. And as, as I mentioned, Harry Grant, I think is an amazing trade in target. If you can go Braley to Harry Grant, 100%, I would be doing that move just because you can capitalize on the points gained for this week. Yes, the Knights draw is very good to end the season, but I've seen enough, to be honest, um, out of the Knights that you know that Jaden Braley, he may potentially get try assist doing some crash ball plays, but more often than not, I see him passing it out to his halfback and his 5'8", Caelan Ponga, etc. And most of the tries, I think, are going to be scored on the edge. And one thing to note as well, I think with games all being played in Queensland, it's a little bit warmer up there. You, normally, they're faster tracks. And I think for, for that reason, from just purely an NRL and game perspective, I think you're going to see tries more scored on the edge as well. So I think tries through the middle, potentially like through a Jaden Braley, I think are going to happen to a lesser extent. So for that reason, I think he's a great trade out target as well. Glenn Gutherson, who I've just spoken about, I agree with that as a sell. Although I think the worst, you know, if you have to hold him, he's not the worst hold given that he's still being okay. James Fisher Harris is still missing for a couple of weeks as well. So I think he's fine enough to sell. Although given that fact that he will probably come back towards the back end of the season, just purely based on the numbers and the low trades and the injury carnage, I think he's okay to hold. Um, but obviously you can do a lot by selling him as well. Now, if you look at the trade in column on the left there, Bradman Best, Harry Grant, Caleb Ponga, I've kind of touched in detail. I think they're all fantastic trade in targets myself. Joey Manu as the fourth most traded in. I don't really agree with this because he has been named in starting center this week with Dale Copley on the wing. Um, unless Manu plays a bit of a roaming role, I'm not in favor of him as a super coach option if he plays in the center wing position. And he's really expensive at 601K personally. I would actually just trade in Bradman Best. That's like a 220K saving on a, uh, on Joey Manu by going to a Bradman Best instead. The Knights draw is probably a bet is probably better than the Roosters, although the Roosters are a better team. So I'll give the I'll give the points there to Manu on that one. But I think at 601K named in the centers, he's more likely I think to score around the 40s and 50s as opposed to the big scores that we've seen in the past few weeks when he has been playing out of that center position. So I don't really agree with Manu as a trade in. Ruben Garrick I do understand because he posted a big 100 plus score last week, but he's coming up against the Melbourne Storm this week. He got a really high break even of 123. So personally, I think if you can wait a week, I would do it. Uh, but I do understand that even with his goal kicking and his pretty decent base, he's still going to be able to score you 40 or 50. So I think it's an okay trade and option as well, but definitely one I think that could wait a week potentially. David Nofaluma, Jordan Rapana as trade-ins to me makes sense. You know, Nofaluma coming up against the Bulldogs, he traditionally does well against the Bulldogs. He's been putting up good scores recently. He's also very cheap at 470k. Like in my opinion, I would 100% be trading in Nofaluma over Joey Manu in my opinion. And similar with the story with Rapana. Although the Raiders don't have a great draw to end the season, I really like him playing at fullback. He's able to get a bit, a bit more attacking stats, you know, for greater ability to get tries, just, you know, supporting on both of the edges. Um, and he's always got very good base and very good tackle breaking ability. And he posted another great score last week against the Knights, even in a beaten side. So I really like Rapana as a trade-in as well. Latrell, I think, is okay as a trade-in target. But as I mentioned previously, I think there are better fullback options to go for. Kalen Ponga is like 60k cheaper than Latrell. And I 100% would be going that way instead of Latrell. 
Payne Haas and Damian Cook. Payne Haas, I think, is obviously still a great front row forward option to go for and the best front row forward option to go for. Last week, he scored like 73, and that was his lowest score in about a month. But I think it's a low upside trade, in my opinion. I think with limited trades for the back end of the season, I would personally be prioritizing some of the guys that you see at the top end there. Harry Grant, Ken Ponga, Bradman Best, guys who do have that really, really high upside. Uh, Payne Haas is a lot more safe with the 65 to 70 point average, but I do understand if you're looking for a front row forward, he is the best one to go for. And Damian Cook, I really don't understand this one because yes, uh, he has posted a couple of nice scores in the past couple of weeks. He's had that big 130-40 um, two weeks ago. But at 541k, I would just personally just fork out the extra 50k um, by any means necessary and get Harry Grant. Because as I touched on before with Latrell, the Rabbitohs draw isn't that great for the back end of the season, and Cook has been way too inconsistent for my liking. So 100% would be going to Harry Grant, and to be honest, no one else I think at hooker. Now, vice captaincy and captaincy this round is really a tough choice because there are a lot of good teams playing each other, which really does kind of hamper our vice captain and captaincy candidates. Kalen Ponga, I think, is probably the best vice captain option this round, given that they're playing on Thursday. One thing to note, though, is that the Knights are coming off a four-day turnaround after playing on Sunday, so that potentially might play into maybe the Knights not being as sharp if you are looking at buying any of the Knights players. Obviously, I know throughout the course of this video, I've been very vocal about bringing in Knights players. That is something to just factor in. You know, maybe if you're looking to go straight captaincy on Ponga, maybe given that short turnaround, I think it could be safer to go with the vice captaincy on Ponga. Um, then you've always got that option to do the vice captain loophole. But coming up against the Broncos, who are the worst team at defending fullbacks, scoring 98 last week, I think Ponga is obviously a great candidate, um, candidate for captaincy or vice captaincy this week, which is why I think he's such a good trade in Thailand as well. James Tedesco against the Panthers. It doesn't make sense on paper, given that the Panthers are probably one of the best teams at defending fullbacks. You can see they're 16th, um, tied with the Melbourne Storm. But Tedesco has been putting in really, really good performances recently. I've been really impressed with the Roosters in general. If they can play similar how to the how they did against the Eels last week, I really like Teddy potentially as a vice-captaincy play. One thing to note, though, is if Nathan Cleary does come back this week, that would put me off putting um, the vice-captaincy on Teddy just a little bit because obviously with Cleary back in the team, I think Panthers are going to be a lot stronger. Um, and we saw last time when the Roosters played the Panthers, Cleary's kicking game was on point. He was kicking to corners away from the fullback, and we saw Teddy really had limited output. So that's the only thing that would put me off putting the vice-captaincy on Tedesco if Cleary does get confirmed to play. But if not, I think Teddy's a good vice-captain. Harry Grant, I've been singing his praises all video, um, coming up against Manly, who are the sixth worst at defending hookers. You know, Harry Grant, name off the bench, to be honest, it doesn't even matter because even if he plays 50, 60 minutes, he's got that potential to score 100. We've seen that so far this season. He has only played a few games, I think, um, playing the full 80 minutes, but he's still averaging around the 75 point mark, just showing how class he is. He always has that ability to get attacking stats. And through the middle, I can really see the Storm doing damage against Manly. And so I really like Harry Grant as a vice captaincy if you do bring him in, because I think a lot of people are going to struggle to bring in Grant this week, given the low trades. So I think if you got him and you can double down by putting the vice captaincy or potentially the captaincy on him, I really like it as a play. Now, how can we talk about vice captains and captains and not talk about Tom Trevojevic? Yes, he's coming up against the Melbourne Storm, best team at defending fullbacks. But look at that last round points. Do I need to say anything else? 226. And guess who didn't captain him? Me. <laughs> but I think Tom Trevojevic, you know, it is a really tough matchup. And I think you can get away with potentially not captaining him this week. I think because that matchup is so tough. I think the last time we saw Tom playing in a really, really tough game uh, was the Panthers when they were at full strength. And that was when Tom was only just coming back from his long layoff. And he scored 68 that week, which kind of just shows the quality of Tom Trevojevic. And I think even if against the Storm, who are the best team at defending fullbacks, I think Tom is still okay for a 75 to 80. And so for that reason, in this week where, you know, a lot of captains are playing in tough games, you know, like Cody Walker is versing the Eels, so I haven't got him on this particular list here. I think Tom Trevojevic is still safe as a vice captaincy option as well. Um, but I don't think I'd be putting the captaincy on him. Although I said that last week and I look like a fool. Uh, but I think this week is a little bit of a difference when he's versing the Melbourne Storm. I think two great captain options to go for is Adam Dewey and Dave Fafita. Adam Dewey against the Bulldogs, who have been the seventh worst at defending 5'8s. As I mentioned, Dewey is on a tear. He's been goal kicking, so he's doing really, really well, scoring 97 last week. And I think if you've got Dewey, to me, he's a great captaincy option. And Dave Fafita, I think the Cowboys, you know, are very weak on the edges. Um, they're the worst team at defending second row forwards. They have put Tamalolo on an edge. I can't quite remember if that's the same edge as Fafita, potentially to counter him, but that could be a reason why that they've gone that route. The only problem, the only problem with Fafita as captain this week is that we've seen in the past couple of weeks he's been coming off the bench. And coming off the bench, just, you know, the lack of minutes, there is that, you know, potential that he doesn't quite get those really, really big scores. 
He scored 61 last week coming off the bench, although uh, the week before that, when he was coming against the Dragons off the bench, he scored 134. So for that reason, against the Cowboys, who are very weak on the edges, I think Fafita, for me, is, is probably going to be my captain this week, and likely I'll probably have a vice-captain on Tom Trevojevic. If if I do decide to ring in Ponga this week, I'd probably put the vice-captaincy on him, but I think playing on Sunday against the Cowboys with a weak edge defense, I'm pretty happy to take a you know 65 to 70 from Fafita and you know if he's able to score a try or two he can get into that 110 point range so I'm happy enough for Fafita as my captain this week. Now getting into the break evens I think this is a bit less of a discussion point given that we're coming towards the back end of the season and it's basically now or never in terms of trying to capitalize on the points looking to bring in players irregardless of their break evens but there still might be some good value picks that we can highlight here. Unfortunately, with Katoni Staggs going down with injury, not really looking at too many of their backs for the rest of the season. I think Payne Haas, who I've touched on before, probably the best front row forward option. Uh, Tavita Pangai is still listed here in the uh, in the Broncos. He's got a break even of 85 at 529k. Um, look, if you've got Tavita Pangai, he has been named off the, off the bench this week for the Panthers. I would be happy enough to hold him for this week and just to see how he goes minutes-wise. In games that he's actually been playing in the middle this season, he's actually had a really, really good PPM. And I've just taken a look at his previous scores this season when he's played in the middle. He scored 79, 182, 32, which was off the bench against the Storm. So I think you can kind of give him a pass for that one. And he scored 42 as well, playing at lock. So those scores coming in the middle are not actually that bad. So I think even with reduced minutes, you know, the lack of James Fisher-Harris, we could see Tavita Pangai play maybe 40 to 50 minutes. And I think the only question mark is potentially his offloading because the Panthers, I don't think they're really an offloading team. And we know Pangai, that's one of his strengths is offloading. And that's what, ma- that's what makes him a good super coach player for us is that he's able to get those additional points. But I think personally with Tavita Pangai, numbers running low, low trades, I think he's definitely a hold for this week. And if you've got him, whether or not you play him or not, I think it really depends on your squad depth. But I would actually be keen to throw him out there in terms of playing in your 17 because I think we know his upside. So I think I'll just take that gamble. From the Bulldogs, to be honest, the only option I would be considering is a Josh Jackson. He's got a decent break even of 46 and at 514k is not too bad value at secondary forward. Although I think at this point in the season, I think you should be targeting those guys who've got that ceiling and I just don't think he has that. From the Raiders, Jordan Rapana I think is probably the best option to go for and not really too much I think apart from that. Corey Harry O'Neill, who was looking like a great option for the past couple of weeks, he has been named off the bench which is unfortunate for owners including myself. Um, so he's got a really high break even of 104 so I think if you were looking to bring him in I don't think this is the week to do so. From the Dragons, unfortunately Ben Hunt has been injured, he's going to be spending four weeks out with a fractured arm which basically rules him out for the rest of the Supercoach season and for that reason I'm not too interested in any of their players. We will see the return of Zach Lomax, not that I'd be going out and buying but hopefully he doesn't do too well so that we can pick him up nice and cheap next season. From the Sea Eagles I think the key guys are you know Tom Trevojevic, Ruben Garrick, Adele Cherry Evans. I've spoken about them quite a bit in previous videos. Josh Schuster I think is still someone who I touched on actually in that podcast with the Super Coach Whisperer. I think he could be a good hold for the rest of the season. Playing in the back row you know the manly draw yes the storm this week is pretty tough but the last three games are very very nice. He has shown that ceiling you know getting around near the 100 point mark when he's able to, yeah, pretty decent base, but also get line breaks, etc. I think he's a good hold for the rest of the season, but not too many other players I think I'd be considering out of the Manly Sea Eagles. The Melbourne Storm, I think I've made it pretty obvious, so I think I'm looking for <clears throat> Harry Grant. Ryan Pappenhausen is super, super cheap at 551k with 149 break even. Look, if you want to go for Pappenhausen, I've kind of given my thoughts on that already. I think I would kind of just ignore the break even just, uh, you know, in this case, because I think if you do decide to go for him, you could just go for it this week. Uh, but as I mentioned, I think if you have that flexibility to wait a week, I think you could do so. And you're probably going to pick him up a little bit cheaper next week as well. From the Knights, I'm very, very high on the Knights and their draw for the rest of the season. I think a, key, a few guys who I haven't uh, touched on so far in this video, Tyson Frizzell, I've spoken about him quite a bit in the past. He's got a pretty decent break, even of 61, which I think he's going to match. So I think at 474k, he's probably at the bottom of his price range. So I think if you are looking for a second row forward, um, he scored 68 last week, basically all in base. So if he's able to go over for a try, um, that's going to push him up basically into the hundreds, you know, if you throw in a line break and a couple of tackle breaks in there. So I really, really like Frizzell as a buy as well. I've made that quite clear as well on this channel in the past. Connor Watson, uh, he has been named at starting lock, but uh, with Suasa Su on the bench, you'd fully expect that they potentially do that late switching come game day. With 85 break even, he's okay to sell. Personally though, I think if he plays any decent minutes, he's able to put in pretty good, good scores. I think last week was just a bit of an outlier. Um, and potentially he only played less minutes on Sunday. So with that short turnaround, I'd be hopeful that he plays bigger minutes this week. 
And from the Cowboys, I think Val Holmes is returning this week. So with a break even of 122 at 578k, you could wait a week. But it is a good matchup against the Titans. He should be goal kicking. So I don't mind Val Holmes as a trade in option. You know, compared to say a Joey Manu, who we saw was the fourth most traded in at 601k. I would personally much prefer going for a Val Holmes who's goal kicking and has shown playing out a fullback. So I think for 20k cheaper, I would definitely be going for a Val Holmes this week if you're looking for a point of difference there. From the Eels, to be honest, I'm not interested too much in any of their players. I think, you know, your Clint Gutherson's are definitely a sell with that high break even and a tough draw for the end of the season. I think if I was looking to buy anyone, it would just be the two obvious candidates in Isaiah Papali'i and Ryan Madison. The Panthers have kind of fallen out of Supercoach relevance with injuries to Brian To'o and Nathan Cleary. As we mentioned before, Nathan Cleary's break even is 216 at $1.06 million. He's super expensive. So I think he is definitely worth the wait for this week. And you can pick him up a lot cheaper next week if he does uh, you know, look pretty good this week against the Roosters, if that is the case that he plays. For the Sharks, Braden Trindle, someone I mentioned maybe as a flyer for halfback at a minus 16 break even. Look, he's definitely at the bottom of his price. So I think you could be going for a really valued option who's goal kicking with a decent draw coming up. Don't crucify me if he doesn't do well, but you know, if anyone loves taking a risk, you could go for a Brayden Trindle. From the Rabbitohs, I think there are actually quite a few options that are worthwhile to consider. Um, Latrell, I have kind of given my thoughts on him, even with a minus one break even. I do think there are going to be better fullback options to go for now in Ponga, Pappenhausen, and Tedesco. If you are looking in the second row forward, Tyson Rizal is someone I mentioned, but I really, really like um, Kaloma Tangi and also Cam Murray. Kaloma Tangi has put up some good scores. He's definitely shown a bit more of that attacking potential in the past few weeks. That has kind of coincided as well with the Rabbitohs playing easier opposition. So I'm not quite sure how sustainable that is coming up against tougher opposition like the Eels this week. But with an eight break even at 518k, if you really fancy him, you know, there's a bit more of a point of difference. Um, I think he's an okay option, but I personally would probably go to a Cam Murray, who I think is a little bit more proven in my opinion. Though he is pretty expensive at 621k, but with a break even of 35, um, in the past month or so, he's been absolutely killing it. And I think he's got that really, really high ceiling that you should be targeting for the back end of the season. So I really like Murray uh, as a buyer in your second row forward if you are looking to go with like a Angus Crichton or a Tyson Frizzell, for example. And Dan Gagai is someone I spoke about quite a bit last week as a good replacement in the, uh, in the center wing if you're looking to replace Brian Toto. He's still hovered around the 575k price um, and his break even 75. So it's pretty manageable. Um, I think there's not going to really be a fantastic time to get him in. I think it's more of a case of, um, you know, if you're able to make that trade this week, I still think he's a good option. But there is an argument to go for a best who's over two, like, 200k cheaper essentially. For the Roosters, I've already given my thoughts on Tedesco, Sam Walker, Joey Manu. I think some good options as well, like Angus Crichton at, with a 96 break even at 599k. I think if you are in the market for a second or forward replacement like myself, um, I've still got Joe Harris. I think this week is a good opportunity to get him in because he is sub 600k now, but with a matchup against the Panthers, which is pretty tough and that relatively high break even, I think if you can wait a week, next week is a fantastic week, I think, in my opinion, to get Crichton if you haven't got him already because they will be coming up against the Broncos who are pretty weak on the edge and I think Crichton could be in for a big game from next week, um, but the thing is Crichton is really, really solid, so I think even against the Panthers, he's still probably good for a 70 to 80 point game, so I think if you haven't got him already, you know, you can kind of ignore that break even to an extent. I think you can just get him in because he's pretty decently priced. I think if you're looking for maybe a little bit of that point of difference higher upside, you could go for a Satili Tupanua with a break even of 47. At 570k, it is very expensive in my opinion. I'd potentially just go for a Tyson Frizzell who is 100k cheaper. Otherwise, I'd probably just lean towards getting a Crichton as well. From the Titans, a few decent options here. Obviously, Fafita is a no-brainer, but if you're looking for a cheap halfback, Toby Sexton has been named again with a minus 83 break, even 173k. He could be a cash cow. I mean, it feels weird to go for cash cows at this point in the season, but if you've got that flexibility of having, you know, plenty of trades left in the season that you've got that ability to trade in and trade out guys. Sexton has actually been pretty impressive and a decent matchup against the Cowboys. So if you're looking for like a one to two week play, generate some money and then flick him later, you could go for a Toby Sexton. Greg Mars, who's also got a low break even of 13, but I have got issues with his job security with Philip Sammy kind of hanging around, potentially in round 22 to 23. But obviously if you've got him at the moment, he's a very good, very, very good play this week against the Cowboys. Corey Thompson is probably the last guy I'd want to touch on as a good option. He's got a lot more safety um, than Mazu in terms of his um, job security. With a 55 break even at 428k, he's probably not going to change in price. I really do like his price point at 430k, uh, pretty cheap, and he scored like 60 something points last week without any major attacking stats, which shows he's got really, really good base and decent tackle breaking ability. And so I think he he also has that high upside, which were a couple of times earlier in the season getting scores over 100. Um, the Titans do have a tough two game stretch after this game against the Cowboys, so 
If you are looking to get him in, I would prioritize getting him in this week at least so that you can get his game against the Cowboys. If not, you're probably going to be waiting until, like, say, round 23, or sorry, round 24, actually, when the draw is not too bad for the last two games of the season. For the Warriors, you and Aitken, out of nowhere, named in the back row and scoring 128. Um, if you listen to that SE Whisperer podcast, I did mention I was almost you know, thinking about going for Aitken because I needed a cheap center, sub 400k to afford Cherry Evans. I went with Bradman Best, which obviously was a great trading option for me, but Ewan Aitken goes off and scores 128, scoring a double, made like 40 tackles, so he had really, really good base as well. 416k, um, the problem I have is that how long is he going to be staying in the second row forward rotation for with the Warriors? Um, And rotation is probably the key word there with the Warriors because they've got a lot of good forwards back, you know, Adam Blake, Matt Lodge is back. They've got like Bailey uh, Sirenin, Eli Katoa, a lot of guys who can play um, in that kind of edge role, even Josh Curran. And so I'm not sure how good his um, minutes are going to be playing on the edge. And when he was playing at center, he was getting scores around the mid 20s and 30s. So for me, it is a big risk to go for him. But the draw for the Warriors isn't that bad for the end of the season. And finally, with the Tigers, I think David Nofaluma and Adam Dewey are your two best bets. If you're looking outside of that, Luciano Lelua put up like 83 points last week um, without any major attacking stats because he's a very good tackle breaker as well and a good runner of the ball. I have highlighted him in previous videos as a secondary forward option to go for. Personally, I would lean for a Frizzell or an Angus Crichton in my opinion, but if you are looking for a point of difference, you could go for Luciano Lelua. And he's got a pretty manageable, manageable break even of 57. Unfortunate news for the Tigers is Dane Laurie um, has broken his leg and is going to be out for the rest of the season. So really unfortunate for anyone who jumped on him last week. Now, I thought I'd give a quick overview of my team and how I'm looking uh, for round 21. It's not great, guys, because with Jaden Braley out, um, to make 17, I have to play Cody Nikarima off the bench, Haru or Naira off the bench, and Spencer Linu, who are all coming off the bench. So it's not ideal. I've got Gutherson with a tough matchup. So I'm really in a bit of a conundrum what to do. I've got three trades and around 40k in the bank. Uh, one way I am leaning is potentially just holding because I can run out at 17. But looking at it, it's pretty suboptimal, you know, having to play a Spencer Linu. So I'm looking to target guys who have got higher upside and potentially point of difference. I think if you can manage to do that at this point in the season, it really should be beneficial for you. So one thing I'm looking at doing is potentially Matt Ikevalu up to like a Tyson Frizzell, um, which I can do via the jewels of Ben Trevojevic, or I might just do Clint Gutherson to Ponga, or I might do the pair of the trades. I'm not quite sure yet. That is one way I'm leaning. I haven't quite decided yet. Captaincy at the moment is still on Fafida and vice captaincy is on Tom Trevojevic, as I said previously. But yeah, that's the kind of way I'm looking at it. You know, lots of injured players for myself and definitely trying to maximize what trades I have left. If I could, I probably would have done Gutherson to Ponga and Braley to Grant, but I'm short by about 50k, so I can't quite do that trade myself. Quick update on our group comp. Uh, Nicholas with Get Two of Us a Shrek, which is an amazing team name, was top scorer in round 20 with 1,693. I'm guessing that he captained Tom Trevojevic. And in terms of our top five, Andrew from Eliminators has actually moved up in the overall rankings to number five overall. So congrats, Andrew. I know he unfortunately did bring in Dane Laurie, though. He's going to hate me for repeating that. Um, But yeah, still overall rank five. You got to be happy with that. And then Jason, Marcelo, James and Matt are all doing really well in the group, um, all sitting in the top 320. Um, Jason is in the top 100 with 71. And as I mentioned last week, with the amount of trades that are running out, amount of injuries, I think there could be big movement in that top 1,000 come the end of the season. And if anyone is looking to join the group still for the rest of the season, the code is 286239. Well, that's it, guys. That is the round 21 trade targets and preview. Hopefully, you guys enjoyed it. If you guys aren't aware already, I have kind of rebranded the channel to be uh, Fantasy Premier League and NRL Supercoach. Um, we are winding down with the NRL Supercoach season, but we are ramping up the Fantasy Premier League content. So if any of you guys are interested, uh, that will be continuing on the channel as well. But rest assured, the NRL Supercoach content will remain as well. Um, I love both games just that much, and I love to talk about it. Plenty to discuss, always on my mind. Um, So rest assured, then the content is not going away. But if you guys enjoyed the video, would really appreciate a thumbs up. Do please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you guys in the next video.